To recap, we spoke about how to identify opportunities the last time around. Identifying opportunities is sure, a lot depends on luck, it's a chance event. A lot depends on individual abilities as well, but we spoke about systematic factors that would enable you to identify opportunities. These depend on what you know, the importance of absorptive capacity, the ability that absorptive capacity gives you to evaluate ideas. Remember, absorptive capacity can be a double-edged sword. It might help you identify certain types of opportunities and might blind you to certain others as well. It also depends on whom you know, the importance of weak ties and the ability that it gives you to be able to source ideas. And finally, creativity is important as well, which gives you the ability to put all of these ideas together. And this is based on the premise that new ideas are essentially a recombination of existing ideas. To be sure, weak ties and absorptive capacity are not substitutes but are complements to each other. While weak ties gives you ideas, it sources ideas, absorptive capacity gives you the ability to evaluate the ideas that you would source through your weak ties. Today we are going to talk about how to determine what an opportunity is worth. We also spoke about the framework last time which is about how do you evaluate the potential of an opportunity. That is more like a smell test. Before evaluating opportunity, we need to know if an opportunity has potential or not. That is what we did last time. But this time we are going to talk about a set of tools uh, that will help us evaluate the exact uh, value of the opportunity. And we will also talk about what are the key drivers of value for startups. Here are the keys for assessing value. The first one is the technological opportunity itself. How much additional value does it create to the customer? The second one, which is more important for you as a startup, is what proportion of the value that is being created can your startup capture? Many of you would have seen a demand curve. Uh, maybe you're familiar with the demand curve. I'm just going to give you a very different interpretation of the demand curve that will enable you to measure the value or think about the value that your intended good is creating in the market. Well, if you look at the demand curve, the price also measures the marginal reservation price, which is the highest the buyer would be willing to pay for, for your good. And consumer surplus uh, is just the difference between the value that the product creates, which is B, and the price that the consumer is willing to pay for that product, P. Now that we know how to measure value for an individual customer, which we said is just B minus P, how do we scale it up to the level of a market? We'll just have to multiply it by the total number of consumers in the market, or stated otherwise, it is just Q, which is the total number of consumers in a market, multiplied by the value that your good is creating in the market, which we, as we saw earlier, is just B minus P. This is the value that is captured by the consumers in a market. Remember, a market has two different types of players, the consumers and the producers. And Q multiplied by B minus B is the total value that is captured by the consumers. A part of the value that is created by your intended product or good is also captured by the producers, which is just the difference between price minus the cost or P minus C at, at a unit level. Once again, if we have to scale it at the level of a market, we'll have to multiply it by Q, which implies that the total value captured by the producers is just Q multiplied by P minus C. Remember, we already spoke about the fact that the value of the technical opportunity is a combination of the value that is captured by the consumers and the value that is captured by the producers. So if we define capital V as the total value that the product uh, generates, the total value is just the summation of V subscript C, which is the value that is captured by the consumers, plus V subscript P, which is the value that is captured by the producers. As you can see, this all reduces to uh, B minus C. Remember, uh, our goal is to calculate the value in terms of the whole market. So in order to do that, we just multiply capital V multiplied by Q, which is the total number of consumers in the market. Here is how we put it together. We need to have the ability to estimate the price, P, 
we need to have the ability to estimate B, the per unit value that we create for the customer. And once we estimate both of these, we can then calculate the difference between the benefit and the price. Here is how we go about estimating B. We need to understand which features matter. You may be creating value, but the point is, are the customers willing to pay for it, uh, which is estimating P. If they're willing to pay for it, if so, for what? And finally, I would like you to take a look at a video. Here is how Palm goes about estimating uh, the benefit that their product creates for the customers and what they're willing to pay for it. Uh, notice how they show a tangible project product so that the customers can see and feel which features matter and hence be able to put a value on how these features matter to them and what they are actually willing to pay for. Well, it's interesting. Uh, evaluating what customers want, you have to go about it um, two different ways. And I'll give you a little anecdote. I worked at, uh, early in my career, before I worked at, uh, went to business school here, I worked at PBS, the public broadcasting service. And um, PBS was always trying to compete with the major networks. You know, everybody was complaining about what's on commercial television. They said, oh, it's a bunch of garbage. And, you know, can't PBS, which gets government money, you know, address all these complaints and do what people want. And we did research study after research study where you'd go up to people on the street, you know, not literally, but figuratively, and say, you know, what do you think about commercial TV? Oh, we hate it. There's nothing good to watch on. Well, what would you like to see on TV? And, you know, they had like, all they would tell you was basically what's on commercial TV. Well, well, we like sitcoms and we like sports and, you know, you know, regular people aren't uh, product visionaries and, um, they're not really good at, they're good at incremental improvements. So, you know, we, if you want to do an incremental improvement on a device like this, you can say to them, well, you're using the device, what would you like to see different in this device? And they could say, I want a bigger screen or a smaller screen or a high resolution screen or a brighter screen, or I want the keyboard to be bigger, you know, but they're not going to go from probably this device to this device. They're not going to, you know, come up with something entirely new. So, um, we do kind of both types of research at Palm One, where we definitely ask customers for current products. You know, what would you like to see in the next generation of this product? Product iterations. Customers are really good at telling you the feature, you know, what they like and what they don't like, and what they'd like to see as an incremental improvement. Uh, they're really not very good at trying to figure out, you know, what might the next big thing be, and that really comes from, uh, you know, you got to have some product people that have experience that come up with some concepts and even then you can't really go out and test the concepts don't test well with people either regular people because when you try and explain the concept to them unless you have something very concrete they they don't get the concept so you have to kind of do a leap of faith and get something you know spend enough money to get something pretty concrete before you can get valid feedback on it so uh, the kind of regular and incremental product development process is probably uh, 12 months on a product cycle. A kind of, you know, developing something really new is like that's a couple of years, at least two, two three years maybe, to really get something new. And then you're still going to require a couple of iterations on the product probably to learn enough about how people use it to make it really good. The, the first trio, you know, was not a barn burner of a product, but they learned enough from that to make the next trio like really pretty good. Here is a tool that we will be using to determine B. Uh, a lot of you might have heard about conjoint analysis. Uh, some of you would have done it in your previous uh, sessions as well. Conjoint analysis is, is a very popular tool that is used for market research. Using conjoint analysis, we want to understand the preference of our potential customers for the notional good that we are considering uh, or you are considering as a startup. This technique can examine the choices that people make and it will help you to back out the value of different features that are embedded in your product. It assumes that the consumers typically trade off between price and other product attributes. And the hope here is that even if you're not able to master the technical features of this technique, you will hire your MBA friend who will help you to do this. And maybe next time, I'll also give you a little bit of a tutorial as to how you can pull this off in Excel. 
For now, I am just going to give you an overview so that you can understand what he is doing. So how does conjoint analysis work? We will be showing consumers a series of hypothetical products which are defined by their attributes and ask consumer to rank order according to their preferences uh, and be asking them to choose their most preferred product. What we will do is that we will also gather multiple observations per person by asking as many people as you want and we will be using these responses to estimate their preferences for various features. We will start with an experimental design by rolling out surveys in which uh, we will include all attributes of your good and also place values on these attributes that we will test. Conjoint analysis distinguishes between attributes and in terms of what are generally called as, as levels. An attribute is something like a price, a color, horsepower, if you were selling a car, or material for the upholstery or the sunroof, all of these apply to a car. A level is a specific value of an attribute. Uh, for example, the attribute color might have levels such as red, blue, and yellow, while attribute sunroof can have levels such as yes and no. Uh, let me explain what I mean by attributes and levels using an example of cars. I'm sure many of you like cars. If you look at the table that's there on this slide, there are five attributes, price, brand, horsepower, upholstery, and sunroof. And there are a total of about 15 attribute levels. Real world design often contains many more attributes than those that are presented over here. Using conjoint analysis, we spoke about the importance of conjoint analysis. What conjoint analysis is essentially a regression technique that estimates how much of an attribute is really worth to a consumer. For that, we are going to use the rank, remember the rank which is the preference ordering of a customer as the dependent variable and the levels of each attribute as the independent variable. In other words, uh, you go to a customer, you hand out a survey, the customer is going to rank order a preference. For example, you might rank order your preference in terms of uh, Toyota, Volkswagen, Saturn and Kia. Somebody else might uh, rank orders in a different way. We are going to use this rank ordering to estimate a regression using rank, the rank ordering as the dependent variable and levels of each attribute as the independent variable. Your friend will give you something that looks like uh, the table that's there on the slide after he or she runs the regression analysis. For each attribute, for each level of an attribute, uh, she might give you the utility or the uh, estimates of the regression analysis. For example, the price of about $23,000 has a utility of about 2.10. So the point of the regression analysis, uh, like we spoke about earlier, is to be able to estimate these utility values, which are essentially the coefficients that come from a regression analysis. Given that the regression coefficients, as we saw in the previous slide, refers to the utility for a particular level of an attribute, the total utility of any product that we might be considering is simply the sum of the utility of its attribute level. For example, a Toyota car with 280 horsepower, leather interior without a sunroof, and a price of about $23,000 has a utility that is just the sum of the respective values that we estimated from the regression. In this case, it works out to about 4.95. In general, larger positive values can be interpreted as adding a lot to the overall product utility. The difference in the utilities between the most preferred and the least preferred level within an attribute tells you how important an attribute is. I will give you an example of that uh, in the next slide. The importance of any given attribute is just the difference between the highest and the lowest utility level of that attribute divided by the sum of the differences between the highest and the lowest utility for all the attributes. If you don't understand it, don't worry at the moment because I'm going to give you an example, as I told you earlier. The resulting number will always lie between 0 and 1 and is generally interpreted as the percentage decision weight of an attribute in the overall choice process. 
Suppose we wanted to calculate the importance of horsepower. We would do it as follows. Um, just follow the formula that's given in your slide. The numerator is just the difference between the highest value and the lowest value for the attribute horsepower. If you go back a few slides, the highest value for horsepower is about 1.18. The lowest value is about minus 2.24. And the difference between them is just 1.18 plus 2.24. And the denominator is just the difference between the highest and the lowest values for all the attributes that we are talking about. Price, brand, horsepower, upholstery, and sunroof. And if we divide one by the other, we get a value of about 0 0.25, which means that 25% of the overall decision weight is attributed to horsepower. Likewise, we can calculate the uh, weights for price, brand, sunroof, and upholstery, which work out about 27%, 15, 10, and 23% respectively. Now, let's talk about estimating B using conjoint analysis. Say, for example, your good is like a Toyota priced at $23,000 with 280 horsepower, leather interior, but your good additionally has a sunroof. How do you go about estimating what the customer is willing to pay for your good? Start with the base price of the nearest comparable good. Note that we had assumed that the base price is about $23,000 from the example. The price utility for that price is about 2.10. A car without sunroof has a total utility of about 4.95, which we had also seen a few slides earlier. If we add the sunroof, this increases the total utility to about 6.31, which is about a difference of about 1.36. We had also assumed when we talked about conjoint analysis that consumers fundamentally trade off between price and other, other attributes. This implies that more the number of attributes, the weight on price is lower. So this is equivalent to saying that we can reduce the price utility to 2.10 minus 1.36 or about 0 0.74. By referring to the utility estimates, we can also see that this implies a price between 25 and $27,000, simply because uh, the range of uh, 0 0.74 is between minus 1.56 and plus 1.15. Now, we can just extrapolate to find what the new price is. Now, we had assumed a linear relationship between price and utility, and given that we've figured out that the price range needs to be between twenty-five dollars and $27,000, we can now solve for the exact price uh, with the sunroof. This works out to about $25,302, as uh, given in your slide. Remember, a few minutes back, we also spoke about the importance of being able to calculate how much you can capture from the opportunity uh, while calculating the value of an opportunity. Conjoint analysis can be used for that as well. That would be based on a multinomial logit model. Your share can be calculated as share of your product i. i is the subscript that denotes your product, which is equal to exponential of ui, divided by the summation of the utilities of all other products, uh, which is what is given in the denominator. Um, which uh, will be clearer when I give you an example. Now, let me give you an example of how we can use conjoint analysis to calculate market shares. Suppose we are marketing a car with the following profile. Toyota, which costs about $23,000, 280 horsepower with leather interior and with a sunroof. Here are the other brands in the market. Uh, they are Saturn, priced at $27,000, 250 horsepower, cloth interior, no sunroof, Volkswagen, Priced at $29,000, an expensive car, 280 horsepower, leather interior and no sunroof. Kia, a less expensive car at $23,000, 220 horsepower, cloth interior and no sunroof. How do we calculate the market shares using this example? Recall that for our good, the estimated overall utility was about 6.31. Similarly, the utilities for the competing products are given in your slide. They are about 2.91, 1.06, and 3.69. What we need to do now is simply to substitute these values in the multinomial logit formula that we saw a few slides earlier. Doing that, we get a market share of about 99%. So we are doing really good. 
In order to be able to estimate value, you will have to be able to estimate your costs. Uh, estimate your cost based on how much it will cost for you to produce an additional unit typically includes uh, figuring out how much of materials and labor that might be required to, to manufacture your product. This might also involve making trade-offs uh, in terms of make versus buy, uh, and all of this we will discuss later on the, in this course. For now, you, you can look at the closest product or service and then calculate the percentage of manufacturing costs over sales, which will give you the gross profit margin. So how do we put it together? We already estimated B a few slides back, which uh, worked out to about $25,302. Let's assume that the cost is about 70%. We talked about the importance of pegging the cost and looking at your competitors to figure out what the total cost of production is. In this case, you know, we, we don't have a, a concrete example. Let's just assume that it's about 70%. That works out to about 17711 per car which gives you a B minus C of about $7,591. Now, assuming that the market size of cars is about 10,000 cars annually, this works out to about a market size or the value generated of about 75 million. Uh, the existing value of other players is about 0 0.47 million. So the incremental value that our product, your notional good is creating in this market is just the difference between 75.15 million and 0 0.47 million, which works out about 74.68 million. To recap, today we spoke about how to value an opportunity. Technological opportunity or just the value of an opportunity is the value that a pro your, your product brings to the market. And a lot depends on the share that you can appropriate from the value that you create. We also spoke a lot about the use of conjoint analysis to estimate the value of your good. Your good should be defined as a combination of attributes. Start with a baseline, uh, which can be a comparable good to which you are going to add features to. Define attributes of your good. Each attribute should be assigned a value, a level, as they call it. We talked about how you can use surveys to gather information about customer preferences. We also talked about how to analyze data and interpret it to determine B as well as market share. Finally, we talked a little bit about estimating cost, about which we will talk a lot about in the future. We talked about how one can go about estimating cost by using public data that may be available from your competitors. Next time, we'll talk about a little more about conjoint analysis and how you can do conjoint analysis using Excel. We'll also talk a lot about entry strategies. Should you enter or not? If so, how you should go about thinking about entry?